Hey guys, it's the Diesel Queen. Welcome to my overhauled podcast. I have to make an apology to you guys. My first few podcasts were a little screwed up. Long story short, it had to be kind of cropped down a little bit because I am technologically challenged. Back to how I am a heavy equipment mechanic, not a professional YouTuber or a podcaster. So please bear with my fuck ups and enjoy these podcasts. Again, I apologize. I'm a heavy equipment mechanic trying to make podcasts, so bear with me. Hey guys, this is the Diesel Queen here on the third episode of Overhauled, partnering with Diesel Laptops to bring you guys a little bit more insight on this industry. Today, I am here with Fernando, who is a young mechanic living in California. Today, we're going to get a little bit of an insight as to how does somebody with no background in this industry find themselves in the industry? This is important because this is the people that we are trying to look for because obviously, as we all know, this industry needs more people. So we're gonna dive into Fernando's story about how he got into the industry, what made him want to stay into it, and his experiences so far in the diesel industry. I think you guys are gonna get a lot of good content from this. He is a very driven and hardworking individual. So I am excited for you guys to see this episode. Let's get it. Tell us a little bit about what you do, who you work, I already know who you work for, but tell them, you know, what you, what you do, who you work for, how you got where you are. Uh, um, I started to work for Cummins and their student to work program that we had. Um, I was going there part time um, every Wednesday when we when uh, our class would have a student to work program every Wednesday. We would go to job site um, and actually have hands on with the techs. And that was a really fun experience. That was really fun. And that was a, a whole different culture for me. Yeah. Um, from from being at school and you know being uh, at a you know a shop where I'm working on a customer's truck, you know, yeah. So that yeah. was really, fun. and and just the culture, getting 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 the hang of the culture because the culture is, is it's it's fun. It's just a whole different vibe, you know. Oh yeah, yep. and, yeah. I get that for sure. Yeah, especially especially when you're in the shop, and then it's just like it's it's fun. It's it's a whole it's a whole different world. Um, but, but yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was with, uh, Cummins for about a year. Um, then the whole pandemic started and then, um, I, I went over to, um, Papi Kenworth with, which I'm currently at right now. Um, Papi Kenworth is a very good place, a very good place. And I've been having a blast since, since, since then, you know, um, That's good. Every, everything, everything, everything I do every day is something new. I, it could be engine work. It could be from yeah. doing the service on a truck from just the whole three, the whole nine yards, you know? Yeah. So your, your timeline here, you, you went to trade school or to a community college, correct? And then Cummins and then Kenworth or, yes. okay. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so were you also an apprentice in Cummins too? Yeah. What, in high school or what experiences did you have in high school exactly that brought you to the decision that diesel in the trades was something you wanted to do as a lifetime career? Yeah, it was very different. I didn't go to college. I didn't go to a community college. I didn't go to a um, regular um, like UTI yeah. or there's really as well. Um, I didn't go to any of those. Um, so the program that my high school offers they offered uh they offer diesel mechanics so okay my high school, more of, of a trade school trade high school okay okay yeah that makes yeah. sense yeah okay. yeah there's like different programs that students can attend that's so that cool can, though because that's yeah. rare yeah and it's really cool um like la last couple of weeks they just donated electric truck a mac electric truck a 20 a 2020 yeah. mac electric truck to our school so to my ex school which is really cool but it's just like since I've been there, all these changes that have been happening throughout the year, it's just like, it's amazing because, you know, when I was there, uh, we didn't, we just, you know, the shop was barely going on because they had yeah. barely opened. And it's just like, man, it's crazy how 
here in, in 10 years, you know, the whole, the whole, everything's going to be different. You know, it's more going to be electric and stuff like that. Yeah. Especially you're in California, correct? Yeah. I'm in Fresno, yep. California. Yep. What, which part of California? Fresno, California. Okay. I, I've spent quite a bit of time in the wonderful city of Los Angeles uh, oh, this summer uh, for some music video filming and stuff like that. So that's, a, that's I, I don't know how anybody in that city would get around without Google Maps. I know. Um, it's like exit and then it's an exit <laughs> within an exit and then an exit within an exit within an exit. It's, I don't know how you guys do it. I'm from Typical. Wyoming and I show up like, what in the mousetrap maze is this? Um, but it's, I've got I've got a couple of friends from California. Uh, I I know I have a friend that worked uh, in Southern California for a John Deere dealership. So I know that sometimes things in California are ran a little bit differently than the rest of the world. So it I find it very surprising that you actually had the opportunity to do diesel work and do a trade work in high school. That's yeah. cool. What made you decide to be a part of that in the first place? I mean, throughout high school, you know, you kind of you kind of figure out what you want to do, you know? Yeah. So I was in that position freshman year. Uh, I was like, what? I was trying to figure out what I like and figure out myself, you know, what is it that catches my attention, catches my attention. And, um, I, you know, I never thought I was going to be a decent mechanic. I, never, I don't think any I, of us do. <laughs> I literally, I literally never thought I was going to be a diesel mechanic until um, one day uh, my instructor Rubio, when when the whole diesel program was starting, um, I remember he walked into my angels class and he started talking about talk about talk about the program, and you know since that day it just changed it, it just changed my vision, my goals, everything, and it was like man, this is I like I'm going to do this, I'm going to try it. So you don't have any kind of like family background or you were obsessed with your f-250 you had in high school or anything like that no 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 like that's cool though nobody, that's cool. like nobody nobody my like none of my like my brothers are no like they're not decent mechanics like here far 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 away cousins that have their trucks that have like they do transportation but other okay. than that <laughs> That's cool. That's unique because, you know, with, with my background, you know, even though I'm a girl, my background makes sense. You know, yeah. I grew up around it. I, I literally grew up in a, the back of a tree harvester with my dad. It makes sense, you know, for somebody like me, but I am very excited because. So what I was trying to explain to people on my podcast with Tyler originally is high school's like going and talking to kids in high school doesn't always work. Trying, you know, as far as trying to get people into this industry. And so what I'm trying to nail down is how can we get and attract more people like yourself that has no background in this? You know, your family doesn't have a background in it. How do we attract more people? You brought up an interesting point with your high school had diesel programs. You had instructors that talked to the kids and you know, that's in my high school, I had, it was a mandatory, we didn't have anything like that, but we had a mandatory classes of welding and automotive and woodworking. Actually, you had to pick between welding and woodworking, and then you had to take one year of automotive. That was a requirement to graduate. So it was a really cool experience to see, you know, the little, you know, five foot nothing goth chick that has like the platform boots that are this tall like straight up like goth chick fucking you know fishnet leggings fishnet shirt in my welding class running beads on an arc welder and would she have picked that class if that was mandatory if that wasn't mandatory would she have ever even remotely thought of trying to do a welding class hell no but she was good at it you know, and that's like, how can we show kids? A, and she literally was, she was straight up like bleached white hair, goth girl. How do you, how do we show people and show kids and get people interested in this when they don't have a background in it? You know, it, it's easy to convince 
the kids that, you know, mommy and daddy own a trucking industry or mommy and daddy run a logging operation or farmers or, you know, they just grow up in the atmosphere of Wyoming in the West and everybody drives a diesel truck. That's like a status in Wyoming. So how do we invite or entice people like yourself into the industry. And that's what I'm trying to nail down here is what exactly enticed you in that. And so that you say that was your instructors in the high school and the fact that that program was available for you to try is kind of the reason why. Yes. Yeah. So okay. I mean, that's more, that's more of, of, of it, you know, like I got into it to try it out and she, and and learn and learn get get experience from it you know but and you figured out you liked it pretty much now i like, like it, yes yeah is I it like the it. the the blue collar part of it is it you know, like the working with my hands blue collar getting dirty part of it is it the technical learning the systems part of it what what part of that do you, did you really enjoy which part of that really was like yes this is what i want to do for the rest of my life i love the blue collar I, I like how it's blue collar i'm very energetic like i'm always like doing something and so i was like i need to find something that you know like i like and move and you know i'm just out there out just out I'm just out yeah like you're not you're not a let's sit in an office all day and i'll be satisfied like god god made this this world you know to enjoy so i gotta be out <laughs> i agree i agree i the transition for me from working six day weeks and working in a shop full time to doing this has been a little bit of a shocker like people always tell me they're like oh it's gotta be easier right like you're not really doing that much. You get to sit in an office. I'm like, yeah, I have to sit in an office. Yeah, Like yeah, I'm not but- used to that. That's not something I'm used to. I'm used to go, 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 go. I've got customers. I got like yeah. 18 jobs on my board. Right. Yeah. And four of them are big jobs that two of them of which I already have torn apart and I'm waiting on parts or approval. And then like 10 other little jobs that I'm also trying to figure out how the fuck to get into the day. And that's what I'm used to. That, that is how I've spent the last seven years of my life. And it's, it's a hard transition, but how do you transition people into, you know, from a classroom scenario of high school or whatever into the, I want to work all day. And I think the people that are like you, that are energetic, don't want to sit down, don't like sitting down all day. That's perfect. That is the perfect people. That is the people we need in the industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we do not need the kid that wants to sit at their computer for eight hours a day and do training and think that's a fun day. Right. We need the kids that are like, oh my God, I have to sit here and do fucking training all day. <laughs> That's the kids we need. When you're like, when, when, I, when I'm at work, you know, everything, everything I do is just like, everything has this, ha, has this like own step, like process, you know, like we, we, we get the truck, we get the truck, we get the work order and we clock into it, you know, and, and we go pick up the truck, whatever we fix, right. We fix, but then we have to write it down. We have to yep. you know, write, um, type everything down on the, on the work order to to say what we did and and how we fix it and stuff like that so it's still like you're still you know working like with computers Mm -hmm. well in the diagnostics you know but still there's still that uh that um like office you know writing down sending notes Mm -hmm. um sending emails or you know to, to like uh comments tech support, yep. you know, stuff like that. Well, it's, it's important, important, right? It's important. Yeah. Your your stores are important to whether you're trying to submit something to warranty or submit something yeah. to the customer. You need to be able to prove why you're charging them $4,000 for a job. Yeah. You know, and, and what honestly, whether it's a 30-minute job or a three-day job, you've got to be able to prove to them why it's you are worth and why what you did is worth what they're paying. They're not in the shop working with you. They don't understand that I broke a bolt and it took me fucking three hours to get it out. It was a fucking, it was a horrible fucking experience for me. Right. They don't get that though. They don't understand that. So you got to in a little bit better wording, 
you got to explain I broke a bolt and this sucked ass for three hours. And you know that, but you got to put that in there or they're not going to understand it. If you just put broke bolt, spent three hours extracting, they're not going to get that. I broke it off. I had to heat it. I had to drill through the center of it. I had to use three different drill bits to get it to the right extraction size. And then I had to get the right extractor in there and you better pray to God, you don't break it (laughs) or then you're really screwed. So it's, Obviously, you don't need to write in a work order like I had to go to the bathroom at this time and uh, I walked over and talked to so-and-so and asked questions at this time. It doesn't need that, but it's really important. And people don't actually, you know, I've worked in many shops. I've figured out a technician either cares about it and understands the value of that or they don't. Yeah, or they don't. Basically. Or they don't. And You know, there's, I can't tell you how many technicians I've met and not even just the old technicians, how many technicians I have met that will write R&R transmission and that is what they send to the boss. And it's like, and they don't understand why, why, why does it need to be any different? That's what I did. It's like, yeah, but you know, never mind. You're never going to get this. You're you're never going to see this the way. It needs to be said, but you're right. And it's going into even, you know, in at Deer, we called it DTAC, which is dealer technical assistance. And that was pretty much the engineers. And we had to submit cases. And if you needed help with something, you have to write a very in-depth story as to everything you tested, what all the That's values true. were that you tested, how you checked everything. Or you're going to get the, did you check this? You know, if you don't write, I checked the battery voltage. They're going to ask you to check the battery voltage. And then you just wasted two hours of your time waiting for a response. So you're 100% correct. You know, it's not just getting your hands dirty. There is office work involved in that. Yeah, there's, there, there's definitely office work involved in that, especially if you're at a dealership. Especially. And you have to um, educated off that too. You know, learning all the like dog, um, uploading files and stuff like that. Especially with warranty. Warranty is a whole different story. Yes. Let me tell you. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not sure exactly how Peter or Kenworth. Sorry, I'm not. You're Kenworth, right? Yeah, Kenworth. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how Kenworth does their warranty, but I know Deer. Um, they just recently changed their warranty systems where you do not, you get paid for what your story explains they used to pay you on book time and that sucked because obviously if anything wrong happened it was hard it was hard i have had to fight i did a skid steer warranty job when i first started in the industry and john deere had these problems where they had the e-series skid steer would have hydraulic or hydrostatic pump failures uh both and it would contaminate the system and that means like metal in the entire hydraulic system which means you have to do what they call a level seven cleanup which is you replace every single hydraulic component you sponge out every single line you have to clean and or replace the entire hydraulic and hydrostatic system on these entire system pumps motors lines everything and they paid i think what they what were they paying like 80 hours to do that the first two of them that i did i was at like 120 was my first one and honestly this i wasn't even i hadn't even been in the industry for a year yet so i'm like what the fuck i spent so much time like line markering every single little component so i wouldn't forget where it goes uh and the second one i think was 90 hours i got paid for almost every single one of those hours on those jobs even though it was over because of my write-up and people don't understand that. And now the warranty, they won't pay you at all. They only pay you based on what your write-up is. So if your write-up says you did 40 hours worth of work, that's what they're going to pay you. But if your write-up is shitty and it only is explaining 20 hours of the 40 hours you have in it, guess what? You're only getting paid 20. Well, the dealership. I, I didn't work flat rate. So technicians just got paid the hourly. Are you flat rate? Yeah, flat rate. So what's your take on flat rate? Because that is a very controversial deal in the diesel industry. What's 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 your opinion first? I I personally don't agree with it. 
I think it creates uh, a situation where technicians are, they are forced to do jobs as fast as they can. And sometimes the quality goes downhill. I, I know that, you know, if you're doing like break jobs and easy shit like that, that you can just knock out, boom, 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 you can make insane money with it. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I do think flat rate can create a, uh, an environment where your technicians rushed, they're going to take shortcuts and they're not going to be as willing to help other technicians because that's cutting into their flat rate time. And yeah. to me, that creates, that can create, not saying it does, it can create a bad environment where nobody wants to help anybody because everybody's worried about their time. That's my yeah. opinion. What's yours? Yeah. My, my opinion, my, in my opinion, you know, you know, since I've been working at a dealer, you know, I do see that. I do see that where um, technicians are working on a job, they're limited on time, and you have this other technician, you know, for example, like me, I'm, I'm always asking questions. Um, I'm, I As, you should. To, yeah, As you should. Yeah. As you should be. Like, I need help. I'm stuck. Be like, of course, man. And they, they only, you know, explain to me. They, they do a really good job explaining to me, but it's not like, I mean, I wish I had them there and kind of like guide me. Yeah. Am I doing that right? You know? Yeah. But, but I feel, I feel, I feel what you're saying, you know, like, it's like, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's how it is, you know? You can't be lazy on flat, right? Yeah. That's for okay. sure. At the same time, it's kind of like, it's, it's all good because once, once you do something and once you learn how to do it, the right way and, and, and good, you know, you kind of like, okay, you know, I can, you know, set some, some time aside and help, and help uh, the texture on stuff like that. I was curious to ask you that, especially coming from an apprentice side. I actually was considering before I started working for a deer, I, I had considered a position at Peterbilt that was flat rate. And what they had told me is I have six months non-flat rate to figure my shit out and after six months it's go time you got to fucking get your shit done and the one thing that i i you know looking back at the first two years of my career um and i think everybody who starts in the industry understands this i fucked a lot of shit up oh yeah you know i i there was time there was months i felt like i fucked up everything i touched and <laughs> but the, the environment that i was working in at john deere I, I didn't have the, A, I was so hard on myself. My boss never had to discipline me because I was yelling at myself in my head more than he ever would. But I, the environment at which I learned in was a good one. You know, no, we weren't flat rate. Uh, I'm not, not saying that flat rate is the corporate problem there, but everybody was willing to help me. You know, I, I was taught to exhaust all my resources before I asked for help. But I was also taught that, you know, if it's going to take you two jobs to line up pins on an excavator bucket by yourself, or if it takes 15 minutes, if you ask for help, you ask for help. Um, so I was curious, you know, not working in a flat rate. I was curious what those first few years look like in a flat rate shop. Is it is it cutthroat? Is it hard to get people to help you? Is it hard to learn? Is it is it an inviting environment for a new mechanic good good thing you touched up on that point and i'm gonna add a little bit to that and i learned in a very good environment well at pape it's a really good environment there everybody help, helps each other I, I might be taking too much on something and then boom you know a tech walks behind me hey buddy you need help and you know, it's like everybody kind of knows and, and and it's like if if I'm struggling or somebody else is struggling, you know, they're going to go help and teach the team member the right way so that, you know, he can do it faster or, you know, he learn, learn something new, you know? Yep. So, but, but, but that's a very good um, part that you said, the environment. It all depends on the environment. Yeah. And that's, that's why true. I wanted to talk to you about that because there's a big stereotype involving dealerships and involving flat rate. There's, Big stereotypes out there. Obviously, you just heard my stereotype version of it. So I was curious to know your take on it because obviously this industry is having a very hard time getting mechanics in the door and it's yeah. having an even harder time keeping them. 
So what I'm trying to narrow down into is obviously you can't say that much about your current employer. I know that. I know how that is. You know, you don't want to be like, these people fucking suck. Can't do that. (laughs) You know, I get that. I'm trying to get to the bottom of like, is can flat rate be part of the issue as to why technicians start into this field and don't stay in it? You know, is, is there toxic, but it sounds like there is, that's just a stereotype. And there's a little bit, there's a little bit about every, there's a little bit of everything. Yeah. I'll put it and like I think, that. yeah. And that all shops have their problems, right? There's not a single shop out there that doesn't have some form of bullshit. You just got to pick the one that you can handle the bullshit in. Right. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> maybe, but it works. It, yeah, exactly. It, every shop has bullshit, but every shop has a completely different personality too, depending on the people that work there. Some of them are fun and laid back. And then you work at other shops and everybody's like uptight, worried. And like the boss walks in and everybody's like, I swear to God, I was working, you know, or you, you know, you work at some other shops and the boss walks in and everybody's like, Hey, and then he comes over and starts bullshitting with you. You know, it depends on the environment for sure. Like, for example, every time, every time I go to work, you know, I'm always like, Hey, you know, what's up, man? Like everybody, I'm saying hi, because I'm just a positive, like to be out there and just make someone's day, you know? Yep. So I pull up, they, they already know me. They're like, hey, wait, Bernie, Fernando. Or, you know, everybody just saying hi. And, that's good. And that's, what's up? Once, once the culture is there, you know, it's it's fun. Everything. But the shop is, like, for me, it's like a playground. Every time I go. It's like, it's I used to call it, so I used to have this old mechanic we worked with uh, at Haunted when I first started at Haunted. And he used to call it adult daycare. And daycare, yeah. it, he used to call it adult daycare and he's his whole line all the time was like, I'm surprised we even get paid to do this. <laughs> but he was also 70, so <laughs> he didn't give a shit anymore. We are living the dream. Exactly. Do you like swing shift? Did you just kind of get thrown into that because you're bottom of the toe pool right now? Or yeah, all, they were looking for somebody in, in, in the in the day shift, but I had a choice actually had a choice. I had a choice to go to day shift or night shift. But I decided to stay with night shift because um this this is this is what we were talking about a couple minutes ago. You know, the reason I stay with with the swing shift is because there was less text and I can get more help from these texts that were okay. you know one of the texts okay. there has me under his wing right now. Um he's really good and he has a lot of experience and and he he's he's helping me right now. He's he's guiding me through um the troubleshooting, all the uh, like understand the schematics. Yeah. Because let me tell you, wiring is a whole different story. Yeah. Taking voltage, taking resistance, disconnect over here, disconnect over here, check resistance over there, over there, over there, over there, over there. Over there, over there. Yep. <laughs> it's like that. So that's the one of the reasons I like swing shift because there's left peg and I can learn. More. So you feel like it's a better learning environment. Yes, that, that, that's that's one of the reasons. That's that's the reason. That's the main reason why I stayed. Okay, that's a good reason. Oh, I, yeah. At the deer dealerships I worked at, there was no such thing as shifts. You know, we all worked pretty much seven to five, and you know, you could vary. Maybe you could come in early and leave early a little bit, but there was really no variance. It was pretty much seven to five. Um, do you guys work Saturdays and weekends? You have like yeah, a five day week, six day a week. So so there's so there's um there's 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 texts that go from Monday through Friday, seven to three thirty, and then there's a swing shift from three thirty, which I'm in three thirty to twelve, okay. and then there's another crew that come, that goes into work from Tuesday to Saturday. Okay, so you guys split the weeks up a little bit, but it's still pretty much five days a week. Yeah, if I okay. When I first, I my first job was at International. Actually, I worked at International dealership for three months, and they it was not flat rate, but they cut our hours down a lot because they were really slow and they could not afford to pay all of us eight hours a day. Uh, I got a paycheck one time, which is two weeks. I got a paycheck that was forty hours. So I just bought a house and I'm like, yeah, I can't afford this. So I run around and I interviewed at every fucking truck dealership I could fucking find or truck shop. There was like this 
Western distribution truck center that I was obsessed with because they polish the chrome on their Peterbilts every day and they're really pretty. And I'm just like that. That's a girl in me, I guess. I'm like, oh my God, it's pretty. I want to work there. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, they laughed me out of the shop and told me I was going to be a distraction. Um, the only person I could not find a job at a truck shop that was not a night shift job because pretty much all the day shift jobs were taken. And at the time I didn't want to do that, but I was just curious if, cause you know, I know Caterpillar, like that's where they start their techs. Like if you are at the bottom of the totem pole at Caterpillar, you start on the shittiest shift that they have, which they assume is night shift. And you have to work night shift until a uh, position opens up and you pray to God, you get day shift. Yeah. So yeah, I was just curious about and what think, your take was on that. And that's what I used to work at. They used to pay um, flat rate or hourly rate or um, what, what was it pay? It, I've always worked for hourly. I've always for, worked hourly. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, hourly, hourly is uh, yeah, yeah, hourly, hourly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's I. You know, equipments, it's hard, too. Some John Deere dealerships are flat rate. There are John Deere dealerships out there that are flat rate on the Wait, ag side. But You know what? Did I say Did I say Pepe pays um, flat rate or hourly rate? Flat rate. Yeah, it's not my bad. I'm sorry. I really That's rate. fine. That's fine. That's good, though, because I, I prefer that. Some people don't, though. Some people can... I like to do engine rebuilds and shit like that, though. And it's honestly, it's hard to make time. It's hard to make book time on jobs like that in the first place, let alone if your flat rate. Um, that's at least that's my like axles. I've done so many fucking loader axles. I can I, in greater axles, any time, any type of internally planetary, internal planetary, midsection planetary axles. I can fucking rip them things apart and put them back together. I got that shit down. I can make time on that shit. But what they don't understand is sometimes these axles are in an ancient piece of shit that's like 80 years old and you break every single mounting bolt for that motherfucker or you have to heat it and cut it out of the fucking frame. And that takes a lot of time. So how in flat rate, how do you make up for that shit? How is there a way that you can still charge the customer for that time if you run into a situation like that? Yeah, so um, basically, when, when that happens, or when we run into an issue, any kind of issue, if it's a bowl that breaks, et cetera, um, we stop, you know, we talk to our foreman, and the foreman, you know, um, talks to the customer and, you know, shares with them the problem or the issue that we came across with. That's and, the, I mean, we do the same thing, actually. Get yeah, approval. It, approval is that basically on more time. So you said you went to trade school-ish, sort of, in high school, diesel program. Do you feel like they properly helped taught you and properly gave you the resources to enter this industry? Did you feel like they did a good enough job giving you the resources and the knowledge you needed to enter this industry and the realistic expectations? Yeah, so... At, at the time when when the, the the diesel program was going on, um, it, it was barely new. You know, we we had no 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 tools, trucks. You know, it was just Mr. Rubio, my instructor, and um, it was all more. It was more of book side that I got. I got. Well, that's still important. You still have to know how the yeah. systems work. But um, other than that. Mr. Rubio is is a really good instructor, like I said, um, and he explains. Mr. Rubio was an instructor at, U, uh, 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 UTI, so I mean that says a lot too. Yeah. So what do you, what do these industries expect? You know, these these companies expect mm-hmm. from you know, um, a lot of it is you can't bullshit around. You can't bullshit around. You can't mess around. You can't. You you have to be tunnel vision. So I had a young lady on here um, before you, and she's she's seventeen, thinking about getting into the industry, and that's kind of all. That's what I told her, and that's what I tell everybody is, you have no idea how far you will go if you show up and you try. 
So yeah, so that, that's yeah. like that's the two major things. Like th these companies are they're not asking you to be perfect. They're not asking you to never fuck anything up. Would they like it if you didn't? Probably, but you learn from it. You know, the only real mistake is one you don't learn from. You know, it that that's all they want because it is still a rarity. It is actually a rarity to have a technician that shows up every day and is reliable and tries. I I I can't tell you how many times because this industry is so desperate for people. So shops will hire anybody that's a warm body, but that warm body isn't going to make it anywhere unless they're trying and they're showing up. And you you can get really fucking far just by trying and showing up. And it, it sounds seems like you kind of agree with that statement. Oh yeah, period. I so do you that. feel like they this school gave you? Did your expectations of this industry match what it actually was? Yeah, it, it matched. It matched. It matched what it actually was. You know, Duncan does a really good. Um, Duncan Polytechnic High School does a really good job on getting Duncan kids ready for, you know, the the um, for work. You know, the work industry. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's a straight school, and and, and just throughout the you know my whole high school years it was just like us like work on yourself work on your skills learn mm -hmm. your skills who you are and and it was duncan that's all that's all it is about you know when you do something learn and just you know next time you do it you know how to do it mm -hmm. so it's just it's just have putting the effort of learning yep well, we we get a lot of kids, and I've I've seen this firsthand. We get a lot of kids in the industry that come out of tech school, and I'm talking like, you know, dear technical college because they actually have their own college, believe it or not. And you know, Wyotech, the big the big schools, right, where you're, you're rebuilding engines, you're rebuilding transmissions, you're doing all this shit. We got people that enter this industry that expect to be doing that day one. And so they get mad when their employer makes them, which for me, I thought this was normal, but apparently not everybody thinks this. They, they get mad when they have to do PDIs, pre, like pre-delivery inspections and services for like at least the first six months, you know, little jobs here and there, right? Like tie rods maybe, or um, uh, batteries, you know, but they they were expecting to enter the industry and just start doing engine rebuilds and doing transmission rebuilds. And I don't feel like the the school that they went to gave them a realistic expectation of what they were expecting. Uh, Wyotech, for example, actually had a pretty extreme deal, which I don't know if they still do this or under new ownership. I went to Wyotech. Your hair could not be touching the collar of your shirt, guy or girl. So if you were a guy, you had to have your hair buzzed short enough that your hair did not touch the collar of your shirt. And if you're a girl, your hair had to be in a tight bun. Like you couldn't have your ponytail touching your collar, nothing. You had to have your shirt all the way buttoned up, guy or girl, all the way buttoned up. You had to have your shirt tucked in. You had to wear the proper pants. You had to wear steel toe boots. And if you didn't show up for class, they, whatever time, it doesn't matter the reason why you didn't show up for class. It did not matter. It did not matter. You lost points in that class for missing time in that class. Go and enter the industry and you're like, hey, I want to take a personal day because I'm tired of being here. And your boss is like, okay, you have the vacation time, take it. So the what I'm trying to get at is like you know, there's some extremes that some of these schools go to to try and prepare kids for the the trades in the industry that are not always as accurate as they could be. Um, and so I'm trying to get down to do you feel like and it sounds like you do you you were pretty well prepared. Did they tell you that you were probably going to be not doing engine rebuilds for a while and did they set that a good expectation for your first year and what that would look like? Yeah. Um, they, I, I already had an expectation what I was going to, what I was going to be doing. 
um, in the in the apprenticeship program. Basically, you do um, um, two years of services, nine, nine, 90 day bids, um, PDIs from everything. But actually, you know, you do everything from services, diff service, a diff rebuild, or it's just everything. Everything you you they put you they put to do everything you know so basically well, you got to be willing to do whatever they hand but you, you right? have but you have to be willing to learn you know if you're yeah. if you're if you're putting in the work of um, doing your training learning and they see that you're you know you're catching on pretty fast then they're gonna put you on doing exactly job. exactly so, that's a really good point yes That's a really good and, point and a good job uh, I. Good, uh, when I worked at international, one of my first jobs actually was one of the, a couple of the big jobs. I only worked there for like three months and this was right out of fucking biotech. And I got to do leaf springs on a dump truck, which was fun. And I got to do a differential third member in a truck that that's like the third one this motherfucker had. Cause he kept, it's like, dude, stop doing fucking burnout. I don't know what, the, I don't know what he was doing with this semi truck, but he broke the axle shafts in like three differentials and w- what i think he was doing was he had the diff lock on when he wasn't supposed to and it, i'm pretty sure that's what he was doing it's like dude stop doing burnouts okay but we did that and then it took when i started at john deere i did a lot of services and you know them some of those services were 12 hour 16 hour jobs you know you get a grader where you have to change all the hydraulic oil the tandem oils the circle gearbox oil engine oil you got to run a valve adjustment uh all that shit those can be pretty in depth for you know just starting out too it took me about i think it was like six or seven months before they finally gave me a backhoe transmission job which i fucked up by the way and it took them i don't know i think they gave me like a month off of it and then they started giving me big jobs again but i tried really hard in my training I, I always wanted to learn. I was always willing to learn. I was always willing to take advice from people. And they saw that. And that's why they're like, all right, we're going to start pushing this girl into more shit. And, but some people expect that they're just going to get that right away. They're going to walk into the shop and be given a transmission. So it's, then they're disappointed and then they're mad and then they want to leave the industry and they're not willing to put in the time it takes to build that trust and build that relationship with your job where they can trust you to do that. Is it, Expen- fuck ups can be expensive for them. Oh, yeah, I, I I remember when I when I messed up a, a MTM on a what MTM on a transmission. The would you fuck up the the connector? I was removing a transmission and I um no I was installing the transmission and everything up. I had everything connected already and I just had missed one thing, and that one thing there- can lead you to. Ooh, let me tell you. Yeah. Let me tell you. So I was, you know, I was signing the airline. There was an airline that goes to the transmission to the MTM. Yeah. And there's a connector. The main, the main connector that, um, and I was hitting it. No, I wasn't hitting it. I was tying it down, and my wrench slipped. Boom! The connector breaks. And you're talking yep. about a four thousand uh, dollar part. The first fuck up I had. Would you like to hear it? The very first fuck up I ever had, which was like, I thought this was the end of the world. It was so bad. Was at McCandless, the international dealership I worked at. I was doing an oil change on a semi. I don't even remember. I think it was a work star. And I got the oil plug out, drained the oil, went to go put the oil plug back in. And I run over to the fucking technician because I didn't know how to use any of their Navstar computer systems or anything. I run over to my the technician that's helping me. I'm like, hey, how tight do I need to make this? This motherfucker, he did this all the time. He'd go over and he'd like squeeze my arms because I was like a buck 15 soaking wet, right? He'd walk over to me and he squeezed my arm and he's like, hands me a ratchet and he's like, I don't think you'll fuck this up, and I, just, you know, because I'm small. Well... Um, I took a half inch drive ratchet to that and I tight or half like my long snap on one and I tightened that motherfucker until righty tighty became righty loosey. 
And that was my first fuck up. I had to replace the entire oil pan and I couldn't get it out. It wouldn't come out. So I had to do the whole like take a punch and a hammer and poke a hole in the bottom of the oil pan just to get all of the new oil I just put in it, by the way, drained out so I could replace the oil pan. That was my first fuck up. That is that is when I learned that that yeah, little so, feeling you get when it's when it's starting to become righty loosey. That's how I learned that. Because, yeah. yeah. So so basically, so basically, I, I, I want to share something. So okay. basically, like for all the all the all kids, you know, my age, I'm 20 years old. Um, I've been in the industry for five years already. So I started when I was like 15, 14, something like that. So. Like I tell my friends, I'm like, learn learn from your mistakes. Like, don't take it like, like, don't put it like hard on yourself and like, damn man, I suck. I, I yeah, man, I'm not meant for this. I'm like, no, bro, just like, chill. You know, learn from your mistake. You know, next time you do it, now you know how to do it. You know, uh, you learned the hard way, but it's all right. We some of us, I I personally learned the hard way, and sometimes we way. all do. We all do. <laughs> yeah. So so it's like. You know, you just got to take it easy on yourself and just be positive about it. Don't be negative. The only true mistake, the only true mistake people make is if they make it twice. They make it twice. Yeah. And they don't learn. Yeah. Those are the people that don't learn from it. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) I guarantee you, you fuck something up bad enough. You will never do that again. I guarantee it. The, (laughs) The backhoe transmission I was given that I fucked up. I, I didn't have the torque converter splined in all the way. Oh, okay. Thought it was. I pulled the total rookie move of bolting the transmission up to the engine flywheel housing. And it was like this far. And I'm like, I got that. I can just I can just draw that in with bolts. Number one bad idea that every mechanic that is seasoned knows. I didn't know that. I'm like, I can just draw it in. It's so close. I got this. Well, I start drawing it in and I hear this pop. And I'm like, Maybe it's just the recess inside this. It's just like, popping. it's fine. It's fine. It'll be fine. Go to start it up. No transmission oil pressure. I'm like, hmm. Turns out I didn't have the transmit or the torque converter splined into the internal transmission pump ears and it broke them when I, because the reason it wasn't going in flush or the reason it wasn't flush to that housing is because it wasn't all the way in. It wasn't allowing it to be flush. So when I drew that in, it broke them fucking ears off. I had to tear that whole thing. I get, I, I removed that transmission in half the time I did the first time. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, you see, you see where, <laughs> yeah, you see that where, where you do something yep. in the next, it's like so much easier. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so, I'm not the only <laughs> Oh, no. And I love sharing. I love sharing fuck up stories because, and that was actually one, you actually did it for me. I was going to ask you what one of your favorite fuck ups are because everybody's got their favorite, right? Where they're like, this was such a learning experience. Uh, because I want to show p- kids that like exactly what you were saying is it's okay to fuck up. Everybody does it. Especially the first three years of your fucking life in this industry are going to be rough. You are going <laughs> to contemplate your life decisions all the time. <laughs> Oh. I, had, I had seven years into the industry, eight if you included school, and I still fuck shit up. I'd still be laying underneath a piece of machinery and be like, why did I choose this as a career? Like, I, I'd still have those moments contemplating my entire life decisions on if I'm good enough for this and if I should even be here. So it's it's normal and it's fine. And that's why I tell everybody, especially people starting in the industry, is you'll be fucking fine. Yeah, you'll be fine. You know, you'll like you'll be fine. Like, you show up and try, a, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, as long as you try. Uh, like we have, there's a saying in the shop that we have, um, where we do some. If we do something or 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 like we messed up something, we'd be like, we'd be like, hey, bro, you still want to be a diesel mechanic? Right. Yeah. Well. <laughs> That is the one thing I will tell everybody is the shit talk will happen. And if you fuck something up, your coworker is probably not going to let it go for like a month or at least. Right. But it's okay. He'll fuck something up and then you can torture him for a month. It's fine. Hey, that's that's just the environment. And it's fun. If you can't give each other shit, that's not fun. You have to work with each other for at least eight hours a day. Like, Let's let's make this a little bit entertaining for everybody, so this isn't like a prison, okay? 
I, I've worked with, I've worked in some shops, especially the first gear shop I worked in that had quite the personalities, quite the personalities, but Wait. it makes Wait. it entertaining. It's fucking free entertainment all the time. We had the fucking old guy in the shop and his fucking <laughs> prodigy at each other's throat all the fucking time. Uh, one time I was watching the old guy was leaning up against the loader bucket, talking to the guy that was welding it. And I watched his prodigy run up with a fucking sledgehammer and he hit the buck, the bucket of that fucking hammer as hard as he possibly could. And I'm pretty sure that that old guy jumped high enough in the air that the two can flew out of his pocket, but they were constantly doing that shit to each other constantly. And you know, some people are like, Oh my God, it's such a toxic work environment. And I'm like, that's, That's free fun. entertainment. That is fucking free entertainment. I, I will watch this shit know. up. If we could be on Comedy Central, we would make a fucking killing. Okay? TikTok wouldn't like us, but Comedy Central would love... Whoever allows South Park to be a thing, right? They would love us. Oh, the yeah, sense of humor love. in a shop is great. And if it's not, like... It's not fun working there. I don't so. know. I don't know what to say. Yeah, so I wanted to share with you... Um, we were talking about um, what the what the um, workplace what the workplace like um, the environment we talking, like what the workplace needs or or yeah um, needs from the technician or, or yeah. you know person that's going into the industry. So my school, what I like about my school is that every Wednesday, every Wednesday, no matter what. No matter what week or what month it is, it doesn't matter. Every Wednesday, we work our work wear shirts. You do what? Work wear shirts. So every Wednesday, we have a Duncan Polytechnical High School work wear shirt. Okay. That we have to wear every Wednesday. Why is that? They're, they're showing us the skill of waking up, you know, like going to work with a work wear. Okay. So they're teaching us. They teach. They teach that skill that um that at Duncan where every Wednesday everybody all the kids are have to wear a workwear shirt okay. related related to their pathway. Yeah, that's good. Like, like if they were going to work, you know. Yeah. And, yep. That that is. I I have, like I said I'm always curious because Wyotech took a very extreme uh pathway which like i said they're under different different owners now and i don't know what they're doing but they took a very extreme route to try to give people the correct facilities and expectations of what employers expect um obviously i've never worked in a shop where steel toes are not required and i've never worked in a shop where a uniform is not required but Taking a day off is not the end of the world. You know, it's, you've got to have a fucking balance. You cannot oh live God. at work. You have to have a fucking balance or you will go crazy. Oh, yeah. Do you find that the other apprentices that you've been around or work with have the same attitude that you do? The willingness to learn, willingness to try, willingness to like want to be a part of it? Or is that kind of a rarity? amongst your peers so there was at one point you know you you kind of see everything you know there, there's this also there's those texts that they just you know, i don't know but you know there's those my buddies they're they're in apprenticeship right now and they graduated as 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 i did um because some of my buddies that went to high school we started at the same time with the apprenticeship program so it's kind of like I see them and it's like, cool, man. Like, like you have the same hunger as I do, you know, like we mm -hmm. go to work, we actually go to learn. Yep. And do what we got to do to improve our skills in the diesel industry. And, 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 and I do see where, you know, everybody goes, boom, boom, you know, like I'm ready to do this. And yeah. Okay. See what, what the day ex expects from me, you know? I, uh, I went to school with a lot of kids and, I, the reason I ask you this is because back in the day, I guess, I'm not even that old. I'm not even 30 yet. But back in the day of Wyotech days, uh, like, there was, like, 5% of the kids that really gave a fuck. And then there was 
you know, a pretty large group that were kind of like, I'm just here to survive and it's whatever, like I'm going to try, but this is college. I'm not taking it that seriously. And then there was a good like fucking 20% of it, of the kids that didn't fucking care, didn't show up, didn't want to try. They just wanted to barely scrape by enough to get a job and leave. Um, There was, you know, there was also the guys that thought they knew way more and they maybe came from a background where they were already turning wrenches or working around it. So they kind of treated schooling like it was stupid and it's stuff they already know. So they didn't really get much from it. And what I've always told people is your schooling and what you learn from people, you get out of it what you put into it, right? You can't just show up and be like, I already know all this. I don't need to fucking learn this. You're not going to learn anything. You know, I, for example, I took a greater capstone when I was in uh, Haunted, which Capstones are the warranty certification programs and you spend three days learning about this machine and then you have a hands-on test and a written test. There was a particular mechanic in there that was the older generation mechanic. And the whole time, his entire attitude was, I've worked on these things since the B series and I fucking know all this shit. I've been working on shit for 30 years. I don't fucking need to know any of this. And that was his attitude the whole time. I had been in that shop for like a year. I outscored him by a lot. Like I got a 98% score and this guy barely passed. And I'm not saying book smarts is everything. We had some hand, we had a hands-on test too, where you had, they bugged the machines and you had to diagnose it. I outscored him. Not because... I know more, not because I'm a better mechanic, because I fucking paid attention because I knew I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And I needed to learn this because I felt like an idiot all the time. And so it's completely the attitude that you bring to the table with these things, you know, it, and it's not even just tech school. It's all the trainings you're going to be sent through for through the rest of your career. Like if you enter trainings where you're like, I fucking already know all this shit, you're defeating the purpose of the training. You never know. You might learn something you never, you didn't know, even if you have been in the industry for 30 years. So that's. You know what? You're freaking awesome. You're freaking awesome. I've worked, I, I've worked in a shop for a long time. So I, I, um, my, my buddy, um, my friend, um, she was also in a diesel program when I was in high school. Um, she was literally, she was the only one that gave, gave it her all, you know? And yes. because of, and because of her, um, her, her name was uh, Alexa. Um, she, she right after high school she went to UTI, but but I'm gonna get to the point. <laughs> she was the only one I would like compete in class, like actually compete, like mm-hmm. because I was I was very like on top of on, on top of my shit, you know. I was very on my on my stuff. Well, you seem and like she, you want to learn. So yeah, and she did too. I seen that, and I was like, man, okay, all the time, all the time, all the tests. If it's homework, everything, she was right behind me all the time. And I was like, damn, this is awesome. So when, when like events will come around, like skills USA, we'll go, comp- we'll go compete with other schools and stuff. Now um, she, she would do it too. So, and it's like, okay, cool. Like she knows how to do it. She can, she has the, the, she has a mind and she's book smart and everything. And, and she was competing with like guys that were like 22, 23. And I'm mm-hmm. like, damn so cool like that's freaking awesome like you know it's all in your attitude about it you know not all girls are like that yeah not all girls are like that there there is a stereotype that people have that they think that just because we're a girl we're like this big rock star which is not that we're just like the guys right there's some of us that are good and there's some of us that suck yeah it's it but that's cool that like in that that's the exact mentality I was getting at is if if you already know that you don't know what the fuck you're doing, you're going to learn way more than the person sitting next to you that thinks they already know what they're talking about. And you're probably going to excel past them pretty fucking fast because it's all about the attitude you have. This industry is constantly changing. You were just talking about electric trucks earlier. Everything in this industry changes constantly. Emissions were a giant change. You yeah. know, a combine has like 40 controllers on it. It, things are always changing and if you can't if you do not have the mentality to adapt and learn and continue to learn no matter how long you've been in the industry you're gonna fucking fall behind 
And yeah. the 20 year old that's willing to learn and willing to try is going to blow right past you. So it's all right. Well, last question, I guess. Do you think there is anything that employers, schools, people like me trying to make podcasts, what can we do to help get people interested in this industry? What can we do to try to help solve the crisis of there are not enough technicians entering this industry to fill jobs? When I was pitched the opportunity, you know, I, I feel like we just need to we just need to be more out there, you know, talk to students, go to go colleges or anywhere, you know, like talk to these students and, and show them the opportunity because um I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of people, a lot of kids that don't know because the lack of information. Well people still there's a lot of people that still think this industry is dirty, greasy, grimy, you know, low end of the totem pole shit job. There's a lot of stereotype that still exists for this. They don't see that like a lot of us have houses before we're 21. You know, a lot of us are making more than our parents. Yeah. And we're in the 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 low level blue collar job, right? We're supposed to not be making more than people in the white collar industry, but we are. And you know, that's the other thing I've been trying to help spread is this isn't yeah, obviously, especially if anybody has ever seen me actually work. I'm the mechanic that's dirty as fucking covered in oil and grease by nine o'clock. That's me. My base trashed. I've lost every tool out of my toolbox. Um, all the tools are spread all over the floor because I'm in a rush. And I've tracked floor dry and oil all the way across the shop. That's me by nine o'clock. I've always been like that. Don't know why. But people think that's like, that is the industry and that's everybody in the industry, right? They think that's the entire thing. And it's not like you stated before, there's a lot of computer skills, electrical diagnostics. There's a lot to this industry and it pays well. People don't understand how well this industry pays. Like this is not just a low level, you know, I fail at life career. This is a career that people are excelling in. This is an actual career. This is a good career to get into. You will have a job anywhere. Oh, yeah. You can be picky about where you want to work, especially in a place that's populated. There's if if your boss doesn't do something you like, or he's being an asshole, there's about eight shops right down the road that would be more than happy to hire you, probably for a raise. So trying to get the awareness of this industry out. And, you know, I can sit here and blab and talk about it all day long. I've been doing it on social media for years. doesn't make a difference. So I've been trying to get other people on here to be like, look, I'm not full of shit. (laughs) There's a bunch of people here of all different levels and this is their experiences and this is what they feel about the industry. And this is how they feel that we can attack this problem of not enough people getting into this industry. And, and to and to be honest, like I've been around, I, I've talked to a lot of people, and almost every all, all of them, like I, I tell them, hey, bro, you should be a, a medicine mechanic. Yeah, bro, it's a dirty job. I don't like to be greasy or or like you know wear gloves. Yeah, just wear gloves. But yeah. you know, there's a lot of people like that. You know, like well, and it is you know it is hard work. You know, working overtime and stuff like that is. But it's rewarding as hell. So I tell people all the time, it's one of the most rewarding jobs you can have. Yeah. So I wish I wish I wish uh, people could understand, but it's it takes a certain type of person. But I'm glad that I had you on here because I wanted somebody that did not have an obvious background as to why they chose the industry. Because like I guess that even my my background makes sense. It makes sense. My fucking dad had a log truck. He had a fucking Dodge pickup truck I was obsessed with, hence why I'm obsessed with second gens, because it was a second gen. That came from my dad. I, I grew up around it. So I really wanted to get somebody in here that did not grow up around it and did not have that background to try and ex- like figure out, okay, if, if you got interested in it and we got you into the industry, how do we get more of you into the industry? So that's that's good. Do you have any other questions for me or any other things you want to mention? Um, what I do, what I do want to mention, you know, for, for the kids, for uh, um, anybody, you know, it, you have to find your skill, you know, you have to find what you like, you have to find 
who who the real you is, you know, to do something, do something. And, and I feel like a, a, a lot of people do do it just because they have to do it, you know, to survive. But mm-hmm. no, you have to find, find something that you like and then do it, sharpen. When you sharp iron, it's the result always comes out really good. Like like they always say, when the process is done right, the result comes out. And I like having people on here that want to talk and want to share and want to be in front of the camera, and that's good. I also want to say too. I, want, I, want, I actually do want to say this. You know, the, you you uh, Melissa, you said that this job pays you with a good result, or um, what, what was that you said? It's a rewarding job. And rewarding. Yes. Yes. Yes, and that is totally correct because, you know, I'm 20 years old. I bought myself my first truck. I have a 2015 um, 2500. Nice. And it's like I bought it and I paid it off. Like, you know? Yep. Like, I'm barely 20. Like, this job can change, not change your life completely, but it will get you. Well, you're definitely above, you know, it's not just a, it's not a low level paying job. It's not minimum wage. It's not, you know, these employers are really stepping up their game and making sure they're paying people what they're worth. And yeah, I flew through pay raises. I flew through pay raises. You know, even when I thought there's no way I'm going to get a pay raise because I fucked up so much shit this year. Like I'd sit down into the review and my boss would be like, you try hard, you work good, show up. Here's $2 an hour. I'm like, cool. That's fucking awesome. Wasn't expecting that. So there's, you can go so fucking far, even if you just stay a mechanic, you know, you can make, I'm not going to put a dollar amount out out there because every single area is different on what that value is. But, you know, if you don't live in California, no offense, you can make like 30, over $30 an hour. Easy, easy. You know, even just being a shop mechanic that doesn't have that many years of experience, you can make, I ended the industry close to that, really close to that. And I only had seven years in. So it's, and obviously in California, it's like, that's like $50, <laughs> but um, it's, yep. we're definitely above the mid pay, I'd say, especially yep. for, you know, like yep. you said, you're not even 21 yet. You already b- bought and paid off truck. You know, and, there, there are people also, in their sixties that haven't done that. And I also bought my, and I also um, got my, bought myself a house. I, I owned a house before I was twenty one as well. Yeah. So. Yep. I, I'm proud of it. I'm blessed. And you should be proud of it. Our work pays off. Like I yep, always tell it you, does. You no, know, just. Well, and that trend is just going to keep increasing, you know, because the. We keep we the amount that they're paying people is directly related to the other scale of this is the amount of people going into the industry. So they need to compensate and they do. That's that's our industry compensates very well. And they are willing to pay you, they are willing to train you, they are willing to pay you, they are willing to give you all the resources you need to succeed as long as that's what you want. So they do anything like like they actually send you out out of yep. state yep. to learn. They pay you to learn. They end yep. everything's paid for. You just have to show up. Yep. Yep. All you got to do is make the plane ride. Yep. Yep. All of our John Deere training was in Moline, Illinois. I flew, I flew to Moline all the time. Um, I appreciate you being on here and I appreciate your willingness to talk and share and be honest and realistic with people about how you got into this industry and what you think about it. So yeah, no, I appreciate uh, you being on here. I really appreciate you guys. I really, you know, I'm very, I don't know. I, I, I'm without words for this amazing opportunity, you know, being on a broadcast with another diesel mechanic, diesel technician. And, and um, <laughs> I really thank you for that for this. And thank you, Melissa. You're awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you.